Um, <laughs> let me begin, actually, the first question, I'm going to begin with the title. It's a great title, it's a great mm -hmm. book, you know, being an author who's been on many of these things, you always want to wave the book at least once, that excites the crowd. <laughs> so, but the title is, is great, Democracy and Chains, and I saw that, I was thinking, that's unusual, Democracy and Chains, but the subtitle in some ways captures it, mm -hmm. the deep history, which means basically it's not just, you know, small, we're going deep here, of the radical right stealth plan for America. So I'm going to do a quick one sentence summary and ask uh -huh. you if that's sort of accurate and then uh, ask you to go a little deeper because I think I want sure. everyone just to get a, a mm -hmm. general sense of what we're talking about here. Um, and as I, you know, I read the book and did a review actually, it's in The Stranger, the, uh, the basic thrust is that um, there's been some coordination over a number of years, mm -hmm. and I'll get to, you can get into that, between, let's say, billionaires, uh, academics, often funded by the billionaires, journalists, mm -hmm. and politicians. And the coordination varies over the years and varies in the, in the, the kind it, it's done. But the theme is all around, as I understand it, protecting the accumulation of wealth under the understanding that it's economic liberty. And so the definition of liberty has been defined as protecting their freedom to accumulate wealth. Is that roughly, or go into deeper than that, maybe that's too, too thin. Sure. And also comment on any criticism that might come across like, well, that's just another conspiracy theory. Sure. Um, well, so I, maybe I should start by saying, too, I'm a historian. So it's, you know, and I found this story from the archives. I, when I set out to write it, the two people who loom largest in the book, an economist named James McGill Buchanan and, of course, Charles Koch, uh, were unknown to me. I'd never heard of either of them in 19, uh, or 19, 2006 when I started research. I was looking at another topic, which was the state of Virginia's uh, response to uh, Brown versus Board of Education and its massive resistance policy in particular and the role of school vouchers in that. But I came across this Buchanan and Charles Koch ultimately through that research. So so it's real, I think you summarized it really well, Nick, but it, what, maybe what I would say is to add to that is that it is the story of a set of ideas that had their crucible in Virginia as the state of Virginia was fighting against the civil rights movement, seeing it as the latest latest incarnation of the kinds of popular struggles that, that brought the New Deal. Uh, and so uh, these ideas developed in this crucible by James McGill Buchanan uh, and then honed over the uh, subsequent decades in response to a series of, of challenges and experiences were then weaponized by Charles Koch, beginning uh, particularly in 1997 when he gave a $10 million gift to Buchanan Center at George Mason University and then going on from there. So it's really, you know, it's kind of in some ways a personal story about these two individuals, this academic who was a Tennessee-born uh, economist, the first U.S. Southerner to win the Nobel Prize, and this essentially messianic billionaire, but who is also quite brilliant, Charles Koch, with three engineering degrees from MIT uh, and a passionate commitment that he, he has had uh, at least since the early 1960s to transform our society in a libertarian direction. A great summary. You know, I want to actually um, get into that a little bit deeper. You know, sometimes we tend to think of folks on the other side, other side of our side, whatever our side is, as not being very smart. And I'm, I'm glad you mm -hmm. pointed out that Buchanan was, and, and uh, Charles Cope, uh, and I don't know about his brother David, how, where he fits mm -hmm. into it, other than he ran as a vice presidential candidate of the Libertarian Party. Uh, but as you said, to avoid uh, the uh, campaign restriction laws, um, they really emphasize the role of ideas mm -hmm. in changing public opinion and the opinion of politicians. Could you explain how they, how they move the ideas, how they mm -hmm. develop the ideas? Did they get resistance from the ideas? And is there a countervailing uh -huh. force out there do you, do you see that is, is, uh, is, in, is in motion? Right. Well, when they, Buchanan set to work in 1956 in Charlottesville, Virginia, at the University of Virginia, there was a huge countervailing force um, present. It was the dominant set of ideas in American public life assumed that government was the 
body to which citizens could look to remedy market failure, to address inequality, to kind of, you know, in that classic um, uh, cliche, level the playing field. And that set of ideas had been developed over the progressive era with federal regulation of pure food and drugs, of food supply and things like that, deepened during the 1930s with the recognition of workers' right to organize with the Wagner Act and the creation of the NLRB, the Social Security Act, and all these other um, uh, creations of the New Deal era that assumed that the federal government had to play a role in offsetting corporate power to empower ordinary citizens and address our needs. And then the Civil Rights Movement, of course, was a new incarnation of that, saying that the exclusions that had been built into American citizenship and into those New Deal policies, for that matter, must be remedied uh, in the name of human dignity and equal citizenship. So it was this kind of wave through the 20th century that built on the idea that the liberal economist, uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, called countervailing power, right? And so he said that in an age of huge corporations, you needed to have the countervailing power of workers, you know, labor unions, of consumer groups, of other groups that could make it so the corporations didn't totally dominate uh, public life uh, and economic life, for that matter. And so Buchanan was taking aim at all of that. He was part of this wider free market fundamentalist cause, some people call it, some people call it neoliberalism, uh, but this group that developed in 1947 called the Mont Pelerin Society, I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but he was part of that, that larger grouping that included um, uh, Milton Friedman. Friedman and Friedrich Hayek, uh, but what Buchanan was doing that was distinctive was to try to undermine popular trust in government, popular faith in government. Um, so that was the, the burden of his approach, and it was actually turned out to be quite successful. You know, he would say to grantors, the grant, uh, potential grant, uh, um, grantors to his project, these right-wing foundations and businesses and so forth, that we think what we are doing is, is fundamental <laughs> to changing the outlook for the long term in changing ideas about the efficacy um, and the justice of government action. And he was quite right in that. I mean, bo both men have been very far seeing, playing a very long game, very willing to wait decades, you know, not looking just toward the next election cycle, but really laying markers down far in the future. And, you know, for that, I don't agree with the substance of their views, but I admire that commitment to a long term vision uh, and to understanding that you need to build a sustained movement to achieve. Um, that kind of vision? Just throwing out some terms, because we all use terms to e either you know, pigeonhole folks or try mm -hmm. to describe. So, you know, uh, my background is, is something in political science, sociology, and I always thought of, you know, liberals and conservatives, and then you have, um, well, you can be radical right or left, mm -hmm. but then you have reactionary, mm -hmm. reacting to something. What you described regarding Buchanan and then yeah. uh, Koch's ideas seem reactionary, yeah. but you also use the term radical libertarian, and in mm -hmm. fact, you quote Senator, Senator I think, Helms uh -huh. from Utah. Or who Hatch, had, yeah. Oh, Hatch, who had, uh, uh, was challenged maybe by a Tea Party person mm -hmm. or someone who was supported by the radical libertarians as saying, basically, these aren't conservatives, they're radical libertarians. Mm -hmm. Go into that a little bit. It's like, what, what are we looking at? What kind of groups, and do they represent real differences? Like, is yeah. there a difference between conservatives and radical libertarians, or libertarians and radical libertarians? Yeah, uh, yes. So I actually think the best descriptor for them came from a book that was published, I think, in the late 1950s, and the title was Radical Reaction. Um, so uh, they're radical reactionaries, really, but that's not exactly a popular name to give to yourself when you're trying to influence others. Um, so they've flown under other flags. Um, they often like to call themselves classical liberals, you know, meaning going back to the 19th century free market anti-state liberals, but that's not accurate either because those folks were pro-education, um, uh, believed that there should be no, uh, you know, no harm principle, um, uh, many things that these guys don't support. So then we get to the question of libertarian versus conservative, and there's a really significant difference between those. And in the 1970s, uh, Charles Koch himself was very clear about that, about insisting that his grantees be unequivocally radical. Um, no compromise was his motto. You know, he would not support anybody who wasn't radically committed to this full, hard-edged libertarian agenda. And the Cato Institute that he founded in those years was actually um, 
excoriated conservatives. <laughs> if you go back and read some of the things that they said about conservatives, they were just absolutely contemptuous of them um, and of the religious faithful as well. You know, they were devotees of Ayn Rand and she was deeply anti-clerical, etc. cetera. Uh, so for a long time, that was the approach. But when Koch got serious about trying to influence American politics, that wasn't so helpful anymore. And he realized that since libertarians represent maybe three or four percent of the population, you know, just according to polls, not even people who would be willing to do the work, they wouldn't get anywhere with numbers like that. So they had to find larger um, uh, uh, collections of allies. So they look particularly to the religious right um, as a huge source of potential support to self-identified conservatives in the Republican Party. Now they've been looking to nativists and the kind of thing that we've seen, uh, you know, uh, come up since the Tea Party uh, with inventions and particularly in the last two years with uh, um, the Trump campaign and, and uh, moving forward. So, uh, so there's this blending that you see, but they're really quite distinct because the libertarians ultimately are committed to the absolute supremacy of property rights, right? I think of them as property supremacists. Um, and in that quest, they've been willing to use other things, including white supremacy, as I show in the earlier chapters of this book. Uh, but uh, conservatives, I don't really know if they understand <laughs> fully who these folks are or how they are being used by them, but it is a very different uh, vision. And I'll just give you maybe one example to, to concretize it. Um, the uh, Tea Party groups were early embraced by the Koch donor network uh, and supported and seen as battering rams and, and you know, foot soldiers and so forth. But the, uh, one of the most systematic studies we have of the Tea Party, the most systematic study, could not find a single grassroots member of the Tea Party or leader who wanted to see the privatization of Social Security or Medicare. But that is exactly what the Koch donor network is using their energies to do, among other things. So I think that gives you a sense. But I actually think the inherited labels that we have don't really correspond to our situation anymore, because this is not a Republican or a Democrat thing, right? The Republican Party has been captured by this Koch network, and we can talk about how if you want, but so the party labels don't necessarily make sense, but also liberal and conservative. Like, I feel like I'm a conservative now. I want to conserve the popular achievements of the 20th century, right? I mean, I want government to be able to ensure that we have clean air and water. I want seniors to be able to have retirement security. I want kids to have well-funded public education. I want to have anti-discrimination legislation that works. So I feel like, hey, I'm a conservative, and they are these radical libertarians. Well, so I mean, I'm not really a conservative. <laughs> but you know what I mean? <laughs> but there's, there, there are so many openings here for questions, so I'm going to uh, <laughs> toss two at you, but one at a time. Um, let's talk about your statement about the, the Koch brothers or uh, uh, radical libertarians, how they've either taken over the Republican mm -hmm. Party or have had outside influence. We often hear about the Freedom Caucus in mm -hmm. co uh, Congress. What's the relationship between them and the Freedom Caucus? What's the relationship between them and ALEC? For those, uh, mm -hmm. you can explain who ALEC is. It's a, a right-wing legislative think tank mm -hmm. funded by uh, Koch. And maybe mention also that in every state there's a Koch-funded yes. think tank that pumps out ideas and, and, and legislation. So do they all fit together in capturing or influencing the Republican mm -hmm. Party? How does that work? Yeah, uh, so uh, not only were the architects of this cause, and here I'm particularly referring to uh, Koch and Buchanan, but um, you know it would also include some of the top kind of uh, field generals, if you will, of this cause. But not only were they taking ideas very seriously and playing a very long game, they also understood that you had to rewrite the rules in order to get what they wanted. And Buchanan had given this advice, and I think that's why his advice was so important to Koch. Buchanan uh, was saying from pretty much the 1970s on that if you don't like the outcome of public policy over a long period of time, and here you have to remember that the libertarians don't like the whole 20th century, honestly, of public <laughs> policy, and I'm not kidding. Um, if you don't like the outcomes of policy over a long time, stop thinking about who rules and start thinking about the rules, right? And changing the rules and changing the incentives. And so Buchanan and his team were, you know, 
devoted a lot of time to kind of gaming out how you could do that, and that is essentially what the Koch donor network and the organizations it funds have been uh, have been doing. So, um, uh, so taking the Republican Party as a case in point, what they've done is um, uh, coming from the historical experience that even elected officials who walk or talk the talk of this kind of libertarian approach to government won't walk the walk when they realize that voters don't want this <laughs> world that they would bring into being, they back up from the brink. So Ronald Reagan was a classic example of that. Ronald Reagan, you know, said government's not the solution, government's the problem, and you know, all these other things. But even in his first budget, when he realized that he would have to, to carry out the libertarian vision, he would have to attack social security recipients, Medicare, <coughs> veterans, farmers, on and on and on. He's like, I'm not gonna do that. So he ran up the deficit instead. And so this is the repeated experience of this movement that if the elected officials are responsible to voters, they won't carry out this agenda. So what they have done ingeniously through groups like Freedom Partners and the Club for Growth is built, and also pushing for Citizens United, is build up these huge pools of cash that they can then use to run primary challenges against any Republican who doesn't toe the line, right? They run a primary challenge from the right, um, and they can also reward those who are compliant with this dark money. And so with that, which one Coke official calls um, our secret sauce, so to speak, um, they have made it so that these Republican elected officials are answering to these arch-right donors who are far to the right of even the base of the Republican Party rather than the party members. And we saw that with those three health care bills. None polled above 18%, you know, yet they were determined to get those through, and that's because they were trying to please the donors and avoid primary challenges. So I think that's a really concrete example. But as you say, there are so many organizations now working on this, this agenda. So... Um, you know, they include the Heritage Foundation, uh, Cato, Freedom, I just mentioned Freedom Partners Chamber of Commerce, Koch provided seed money for the Federalist Society, which now vets all Republican judicial nominees. So there's all these national organizations. There's also the state organizations of something called the State Policy Network. Um, and I believe yours is the Evergreen Policy Institute. I forgot to look before. Uh, right, and it's also, there's um, an article that uh, Danny Wisnett just did talking about um, I think it's the Pacific Freedom Fund or something like uh -huh. that. And uh, they are the one that uh, they, he profiled someone rather in a positive light mm -hmm. uh, saying how um, the, the Freedom Fund is now challenging a number of laws that Seattle has passed yes. and going to courts and trying to win those cases. And, uh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and say that one of the frustrations, as you mentioned, that mm -hmm. the, the radical right agenda has and trying to execute it seems to be, from what you wrote, is the problem of majority rules. Yes. And that, um, w in fact, one of the uh, big time activists, I think it was Ray Rothbard or whatever, said mm -hmm. basically the definition of, of government corruption is that the politicians are voting according to the majority of people who are do not have the interest of economic liberty in mind. So mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they deal with that? How do they get around, or how do they water down uh, majority vote? In fact, yeah, perhaps use uh -huh. Chile as a, an example, yeah. because that is a fascinating example of how the uh -huh. libertarians took over the government mm -hmm. and tried to change the laws, the rules, so that no matter who got elected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe this goes back also to a, an earlier uh, part of a question that you asked and I realized I didn't answer, which is, you know, what do you say if people say, oh, this is just a conspiracy theory? It's not a conspiracy. I never said it was a conspiracy. The only where, place that book appears, the place no, that No, you word, don't mention no, it here. Buchanan <laughs> himself, though, when he started to organize, uh, try to help organize a counterintelligentsia in the earlier, early 70s, said conspiratorial secrecy is at all times essential. But so he said that, I didn't. But I I don't think this is a conspiracy because a conspiracy by definition involves illegality. I don't think we actually have a word for what we're seeing, but what we're seeing is concerted action by some of the wealthiest people on the planet who have become convinced that their fellow citizens are exploiting them um, through the tax system, uh, seriously, um, and, that are exploiting them. And so, the, and Buchanan used this language of predators and prey, and the predators were folks like senior citizens seeking a prescription drug benefit, environmental seeking tax transfer 
predators to deal with brown fields or polluted water. What, you know, like all of these folks were the predators, and the prey were unwilling taxpayers like Charles Koch. Um, so, uh, so it kind of upends the world as most of us understand it. But it, it is not a conspiracy, but it is intensely concerted action um, on the part of people who are wealthy enough to hire extremely good legal talent and to dig deep into the rules of all kinds of policies and think about how to change those rules in order to get the outcomes uh, that they want. So the most dramatic example of that in my book, and there's a whole chapter on it, uh, was Chile in the years of the uh, Pinochet dictatorship when, when uh, there was a military coup against the Allende uh, socialist government uh, in 1973, and that dictatorship uh, went on to completely destroy any form of popular power, right? Trade unions, farmers associations, student groups, the free press, and so forth, and having undermined any popular power and tortured thousands of people, or you know, killed thousands and tortured tens of thousands, uh, they also enacted radical policy changes, including privatizing social security, sending off Chileans' um, life savings to the financial sector, which of course they deregulated, and it behaved just as you would expect that it would behave, and many people lost their life savings, also privatizing education, doing all these other uh, radical changes. But in 1980, they realized they were going to have to go back to civilian rule at some point. They were going to have to have a representative government. So they wanted to go back to that with a constitution that would keep the people from being able to change what they had done. And Buchanan was brought in to advise on that in 1980. It's called the Constitution of Liberty. And to this day, uh, it has made it impossible for Chile's elected leaders, in the words of one, to get her hands around the economy. Um, so Michelle Bachel, I, I think I might go too into the no, weeds. No, no, no. Keep going, but uh, I, I think the, uh -huh. the challenge maybe many people don't realize is that it's not just policies, but like changing yeah. the rules of the game. Yeah. Um, in their instance, I think uh, one third of the legislators are guaranteed to mm -hmm. basically be right wing. I'm not sure how they do it, but yeah. it's in the Constitution, and the change of the Constitution mm -hmm. is very difficult. You made mention in our discussion. I'm not sure if it comes out in the book very much because I don't remember seeing it. There is a, an attempt to change the Constitution right now. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. While uh, we have all been paying attention to the distractor in chief, right, with his <laughs> shiny objects and his tweets over here, keeping us all in a state and, you know, occupied with that, the uh, um, Coke dominated state legislatures around the country with prodding from the American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, and others have been racking up authorizations from the states to convene a constitutional convention under Article 5 of the Constitution. And they now have 28 of the 34 states needed to call a constitutional convention while we've been distracted with other things. Um, and to understand how radical a proposition that is, there has never been a state convened constitutional convention since the document was ratified, right? All the amend amending of the Constitution has gone through the familiar route. You go through Congress, you send it out to the states, you have these open public discussions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this Koch donor network is trying to change our ultimate rules document, which is our Constitution, by convening this uh, um, uh, state um, uh, uh, assembled uh, constitutional convention. And one of the things that's really troubling to me is that they only need six more states. There are six states that are dominated by the Republican Party, both houses of the legislature, that have not yet authorized. And I believe that the deficit that they've um, uh, pushed up through the tax bill that was passed in December um, and the recent budget will be used as the excuse to get the authorizations from those remaining six. So this is really, really serious stuff. I mean, even conservative justices like Berger said this would be crazy to call a constitutional convention like this. It would necessarily be a runaway convention, very, very dangerous and destructive. But they're really determined to do it because they want to change our ultimate rules book just like they changed Chile's. And it's, it is a legal function too. It's What's right it? in the Constitution. So yes. they could yes. call something like this together. Yeah, I think they actually take pride in the fact that they yes. are able, I mean, I think they are vulnerable on tax law. <laughs> That's the one place, you know, with abusing 501c3 mm -hmm. uh, laws for nonprofits that shouldn't be engaged in, in political um, uh, yeah. campaigning and so forth. But basically, yes, this is a legal effort. You know, they have lots of law professors that they fund and legal thinkers, um, and they've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, and they are figuring out ways to move legally 
to bind popular power. I, I was unaware of this movement until I went to a couple of ELEC conferences, and uh, they had major speakers talking about that. Wow. And one of the major pushes is to do, uh, there's actually a division in the, in the right wing. Some want a constitutional convention to just look at everything. Others want to limit it just to passing a uh, balanced budget amendment. Yes. Um, which I think would they see as a way of crippling government. Yeah, and also these guys are, you know, I mean, if you have a lot of money, you can hire a lot of people, right? And so they hire pollsters and they understand that a balanced budget amendment actually polls well, as does voter ID. Um, uh, so those are things that they push for um, above all. But the thing that most people don't understand about a balanced budget amendment is that it would undermine Social Security and Medicare and all the kinds of regulations that people care about. And so in the past, when they've tried to get a balanced budget amendment through Congress, it's always hit the shoals of the public starting to understand just before it goes through and backing up from the brink. So, But I believe they're going to use the balanced budget amendment like a grocery store uses a loss leader right? Take this thing that's popular, get people in the door, and then you get this other stuff through. And just to give you a sense of how radical their vision is, one of the things that they've pushed for, and actually some state, um, govern state authorizations I think have included, is they want to repeal the 17th Amendment to the Constitution. Now you're all scratching your heads yeah. going, which one is that? Uh, that is the one that allowed the direct election of U.S. Senators. The progressive era measure, uh-huh. Because in the progressive era, people could see, then, you know, at that point, state uh, governments chose the U.S. senators, and people could see that corporations found it very easy to dominate state governments, and that's why we got that amendment, so that we can directly elect our U.S. senators. Well, these guys see the same thing. They're very good at dominating state government, because only usually about a fifth of people pay attention to what's going on in their state legislatures, so they are trying to get rid of that. But that's you know just one uh, example of this. You can actually go online if you look up liberty amendments. You'll see there are ten of them. Uh, uh, some poll tested, like the balanced budget amendment and the voter ID. You, right in your title, and then you talk about it uh -huh. in your chapters, the use of stealth. Yeah. That it runs somewhat along the lines of since the majority of people do not support many of their mm -hmm. uh, policy objectives, um, they need to. Get it, they need to market it in a way that is not necessarily straightforward, shall right. we say. And some of the uh, strategies, again, in your book, you mentioned that they uh, end up admiring uh, Rothbard and some other people mm -hmm. is V.I. Lenin, mm -hmm. and not in the result, but in how uh, Lenin was able to uh, overthrow, in that case, with the Kerensky government, mm -hmm. which was a, a supposedly a democratic government. And so, is there, were they serious or are they, how does that tie into the stealth strategy? Mm -hmm. And is there really, as you said, as you began to say, a cadre of folks who are supporting these ideas and this? forward movement. Yeah, so they definitely, from the 1970s onward, there was a particular uh, libertarian named Murray Rothbard, who was uh, Charles Koch was patronizing at that point, who, and it, it's kind of a funny story, I won't go into it, but he had grown up in this milieu in New York with relatives who were communists, and he was kind of a polymath guy and loved to, anyway, so he recommended that Charles Koch read Lenin um, to think about how to carry out a radical transformation in a place where you didn't have, you know, sort of full uh, majority, majority support. And and so the, the core thing I think they took from Lenin, well, it was a, a great deal of strategic acumen, but particularly an emphasis on developing a cadre of people who would be deeply, deeply trained in these ideas, who would be really committed to the cause, who they could send into larger organizations, and those people would turn the larger organization rather than being turned by it. This was a kind of Leninist thing. And you could say the Republican Party, you know, after 2010 is really an example of that, where you had this minority of people who were, you know, deeply, deeply committed ideologues who would not come compromise, who were able to transform and reroute this much larger operation by their sheer determination and, um, and their, their kind of no compromise uh, tactics. So, uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's an abiding element of this, that there is a really committed libertarian cadre, and they keep building it too. They're recruiting in schools to try to build that up with the, the outposts they have on college campuses. Uh, but as far as the stealth, yeah, the stealth is all over this. And I think if you take nothing else from our discussion today, 
today, or if you read the book, from the book, the single most important finding, I believe, of my research is finding these guys, the architects of this cause, saying again and again in their own words that they understand that they are a permanent minority that the public does not agree with them, that the public does not want the world that they are trying to bring into being, and that's why they are using these tactics of going around and re-rigging the rules. Things like voter suppression, right? Keep away those, keep, keep from the polls those who would oppose this agenda. And clearly they have targeted African Americans, uh, but not only African Americans. That's the case that's, that's legally actionable, so we've focused on that, but they have aimed at college students all around the country to try to keep young people people from voting because they know young people, whatever their backgrounds, tend not to agree with this agenda. So voter suppression uh, is one. To get that voter suppression, they promote the myth of voter fraud. There is absolutely no serious research anywhere that has been able to confirm that this is a significant problem in our society, and yet it's a talking point of all these Republican operations. They also did the most uh, sophisticated and radical gerrymander in our history to misrepresent the will of the electorate so that now these, in states like mine in North Carolina, you have these uh, Republican officials choosing their voters rather than the voters choosing their officials. And that's enabled them to radically misrepresent the people in the delegations they send to Congress and within the state uh, itself. So those are just some of the examples. Maybe another one I think that would be good and might um, if people might remember was uh, Scott Walker, Governor Scott Walker in Wisconsin in, in 2011. That was kind of like the opening shot of all of this, you know, where we all began to notice it. But when he took away collective bargaining rights from public sector workers, he never campaigned on that. Never, right? Um, but when he was talking among his supporters, he said, this is our moment. And then in another context, he said, we dropped the bomb, right? Meaning this was the single most important thing that they could do to reshape the terrain of politics, was to, to undermine public sector labor unionism. And again, I think if you're not honest with people that that's what you're trying to do, but that is what you're trying to do, that's stealth. Um, this may be the last question, uh, for me at least, uh -huh. and we'll go to the audience. Um, Trump, Trumpism, uh -huh. yeah. and particularly tying it into um, what you write in your book about the recognition when you want to change not just the policy but the rules, focusing on the courts and yep. getting new judges in. And I was surprised to read that both uh, read that both Kennedy and Powell in the Supreme Court mm -hmm. came out of that uh, mm -hmm. Coke-funded uh, institutions. What do you see happening as now and, and going forward with their agenda and how Trump, uh, there's sort of like 40 openings right now in yeah. the various federal positions. Yeah, I should say, um, uh, Lewis Powell and, um, and, and Anthony Kennedy both appear in the book. I don't know that they had Coke funding, but they oh. were part of this Buchanan circuit oh, Buchanan. that okay. kind of then merges with the Coke, uh, Coke network. But yeah, th this, um, and I think this is something that people haven't recognized as much in writing about the Coke. You know, we've had brilliant journalists like Jane Mayer who wrote Dark Money, uh, many other people, you know, who have gotten uh, lesser renown, but done really good work about the Kochs, have focused on aspects of this story, but not enough, I don't think, on the legal strategy, which has been in place since 1970. And there was a guy who Buchanan had hired as the dean of the law school at George Mason, a guy named Henry Manny, who in 1970 began running these uh, summer uh, uh, training camps kind of for federal judges and legal scholars. They, people would joke about it as Henry Manny summer camp. Charles Koch was funding that from the outset. And by the mid-1990s, two-fifths of all sitting federal judges had gone through Henry Manny's summer camp. Okay, so it's that ambitious an effort to remake the judiciary, the legal academy, constitutional thought, et cetera. So it's, it's really serious uh, stuff. Uh, but then, you know, Obama had chances to put people in, so it's not, you know, it's not, that's not the current figure. But with the brinkmanship that the Koch donor network has pushed on the Republican Party, you know, Mitch McConnell in the Senate denied President Obama the right of any sitting president, right, to uh, have his Supreme Court nominee be considered. So effectively stole that seat from the president and also held back so many judicial appointments from President Obama that Donald Trump, in just the brief time he's been in office, has appointed more federal uh, judges than any any president, I think, in like living memory is, is, is the, uh, the comparison. So it's really serious business the way they're trying to change the courts. Also in places like my own state of North Carolina, um, 
you know, the news focuses all the time on Trump or so much on national matters, but they're actually trying to get rid of an independent judiciary for all intents and purposes in North Carolina because the judiciary keeps getting in their way, right? And saying that their voter suppression and their gerrymandering, all these things are unconstitutional. And so they have already shifted us away from public financing of judicial elections. They're now in different places trying to change the way that judges are, are um, chosen, the districts they represent. It is really, um, um, a kind of uh, all-out kind of uh, war, in a way, with no Geneva Conventions in terms of abiding by traditional understandings of what the political process should be and, you know, that there should be um, fairness towards one's opponents in the knowledge that someday, you know, you would come to power and you want them to be fair to you. But that, that they've really thrown that out. Um, and as a result, they've gotten extraordinary power. Okay, now that we find everybody, <laughs> if, you, if you have any questions, please walk up to the microphone, and, we're, and please do make him a question. So, so I'd like to shift the focus away from the stealth plan uh -huh. to the question of chains, which I think is even more important. Yeah. Good. Basically, the, the attempt is to take power away from legislatures, from democratic legislatures, and put them in courts and constitutions. Because mm -hmm. that tends yes. to entrench powers, and that allows uh, great quantities of money to affect the outcome more easily. So they don't want Nick Licata being a city council person, mm -hmm. voting for with 3% tax on Amazon. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to stop that in the courts or at the state level. So I think we really have to think if a, a totally judicialized uh, political, political system is mm -hmm. really political or can be democratic, and whether we have to somehow find ways to transfer power back from the judiciary and the constitution, mm -hmm. the fundamentalist constitution, to legislators that are democratic. Okay, that's the question. Excellent, that, that, excellent, that was... excellent question and very well expressed. He was saying that this its strategy seems to be trying to take power away from legislators as the exe elected representatives of the people and lock it into the judiciary with a transformed constitution so that legislators like Nick can't do things like a 3% tax on Amazon or increasing the, you know, uh, living wage or, you know, having anti-discrimination ordinances. That is exactly right. That is precisely what this strategy is. And and it's very interesting that after all these years of saying that they were against an activist judiciary, if you go and look at what particularly the libertarian right is saying now, one of their top people wrote a book called The Case for an Activist Judiciary. They want a judiciary, and Buchanan urged this, like the judiciary of 1900, that could strike down any kind of popular reform measure as an infringement on property rights and a violation of freedom of contract. So you're, you're, you're totally, uh, totally right about that you know and it's interesting that you mentioned um, Amazon and that you know that uh, here because I've been watching these um, uh, the citywide bidding that Amazon is doing for this yes. you know second headquarters and it's very Buchanan like as a strategy in that the different cities are left in the dark about what's going on and what the other bids are and Buchanan actually was um, advising business corporate people and right-wing foundations from the 80s on that they should be adopting action he said, on the spectrum of secession. Uh, that would include uh, privatization, devolution, federalism, et cetera. But the idea is setting it up so that corporations who wouldn't be powerful if the people were voting would be able to use the threat of exit um, or coercive bargaining to get what they want. So, um, so I think that, that that's an interesting example, too, that the more we have things out in the sunlight and subject to uh, popular discussion and deliberations and voting, the more democratic a society will be. And if we lose that, we're in trouble. What has been the response of your students at Duke University to your book? And I don't know if you teach a class about this, but I'd be very curious to know if they understand the stakes of what you have written about and if they have been energized by what you are talking about. 
Thanks. Um, well, I, I'm one of those um, uh, teachers who doesn't, I don't know, sort of feel shy about teaching my own stuff or whatever. So I haven't taught my, my book either to graduate students or undergrads, um, but I, so I'll answer the question uh, differently and say that I've been speaking pretty much since the book was published around the country uh, to all kinds of audiences, and it's been really uh, exciting and I don't know, humbling and gratifying to see the response from people of all ages and across all sectors of progressive politics for the you know folks that are not on the campuses, that people are really understanding that this is an emergency moment for our democracy, that what's happening now is not at all normal, <laughs> and it's really dangerous, and it also means that those who have been trying to do the good work of you know advancing workers' rights, of getting things like family leave, all the, you know, all the good things that progressives uh, try to do, that the old strategies are not working in the face of this enterprise, and so people are looking to develop new alliances, to try out new strategies, et cetera. So I've been really encouraged by that. So even though my message sounds very dire, I think it's also true that there is no crisis that's not an opportunity. And this opportunity is not only to defend, but to renew and enrich our democracy going forward into a new century, because that's what we got to do. <laughs> so, and there's a lot of energy. I'm seeing a ton of energy for that. Hello Hi. there. The Hi, uh, Hi, Professor Chris. McLean. Um, so I, I, I have many questions all of which, most of which I will defer for later. Okay. So, but I'll ask this question right now. Uh, and the question is, so why, so what motivates these people on the right um, um, to buy into this program? I'm not talking about, because mm -hmm. you mainly speak in your book about, you know, the donor classes right. and, and, and intellectuals. Uh -huh. So what about the people at the individual yes. mass level? Yeah. Why are they motivated to buy this stuff? Great. Yeah, so this is Professor Christopher Parker from the University of Washington who wrote a brilliant book called Change We Can't Believe In uh, about the Tea Party that you should read. Um, but so, and, and you're absolutely right that, that my book really focuses much more on these high strategists, you know, and what they were doing. But as I said before, you know, they, they understood um, certainly by the 1990s that there was no way that they were going to make it on their own steam. So they had to get these wider groups into action. So one of them is the religious right, particularly white evangelicals, and because white evangelical, it's not a theology, right, because there are African-American uh, evangelicals who don't share these political views, it's really we're starting to realize how much white nationalism has been part of white evangelicalism, particularly in the more, uh, certainly in places like Liberty University and whatnot, and so, uh, so they have tapped into these broader bases and have no shame about uh, activating the fears and the hatreds and the anxieties of ordinary people, uh, white people, to get them to the polls to vote for this agenda. So certainly that is the case with the religious right. I've seen this again and again in North Carolina where these guys are really thinking about you know, economic liberty and property supremacy above all, but to get people to the polls to make that happen, they have used prejudice against gay people, right? Saying, trying to get an amendment to our constitution that would disallow um, uh, same-sex marriage. Um, the bathroom bill that you've probably heard about, so that was uh, to, against trans people, and then they had built into that that no locality could raise their minimum wages, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, nice guys. Um, anyway, so there's that. And then also I will say, too, with the, the incitation of racism and the, the, the strategic use of racism that we've seen, particularly since, uh, you know, during the, the um, uh, primary season and the election of Donald Trump and his conduct in office, um, that has become so much more apparent in the ways that you wrote about in your book, or anticipated, I guess I should say. But um, I'll just give you one example. There's a group called Judicial Watch. Um, um, and uh, it's endorsed by Vice President Mike Pence and by Ed Meese, who's been working with Buchanan since the 1970s. I mean, Buchanan's dead now, but had been working with him since the 70s. He also endorses this group. And this group, I know because my spouse got on the mailing list, so we know what all the folks are up to. They were sending out mailings regularly, I'd say probably like every week in the run-up to the 2016 election, saying, do you realize your election is about to be stolen by millions of illegal aliens. I mean, every word just about in that, except the prepositions, is a punch word, right, to these anxious white folks who fear their society's changing, who don't like all these brown people coming in, and but it's total fake, right? Because these undocumented people aren't trying to vote. They're just trying to work. They don't want to get caught by the authorities and lose their chance to work. So it's, it's just incendiary... Um, 
uh, demagogery. So yeah, so they, they can't get the ball down the field without tapping into these other things, which I also um, saw Buchanan's team doing at the University of Virginia in uh, the era of massive resistance. That's where my story starts. And so Maya Angelou, the great writer, once said, um, when people show you who they are, believe them. Uh, so that's kind of what I took from what I saw in 1959. Thanks, Chris. Uh, first, just a suggestion, I think in avoiding the term conspiracy, simply pointing out that this is a highly organized anti-democratic movement yes. would be a way to make clear what's going on. But uh, a question about Buchanan's books, mm -hmm. do they have any real continuing impact? I mm -hmm. tried to get through a couple of them and it's pretty tough going and I find it hard to believe that anyone takes this stuff really seriously. <laughs> well, I like, I like your, your summary. So what do you say? A, a very determined, well-organized, concerted, anti-democratic movement. I think that's a, a good descriptor. On Buchanan's work, I mean, he actually was a much better writer than most economists. <laughs> Anyone here who is an economist, they might challenge me, but his, he, he really wrote more in the vein of rethinking the social contract. Um, so there's a lot of game theory and, and stuff like that, but, but he is kind of readable compared uh, to others. And well, his work can be, um, uh, I mean, it does have, like, there, as a political scientist I was on a panel with about this, and she said, you know, there's some um, heuristic value, people mm -hmm. will say, to, you know, sometimes you have a good idea to think with. Like, hmm, would it be interesting to see if politicians are really just trying to buy votes or you know there's different questions that you can ask and I'm not against the asking of the questions at all I teach the history of social movements I'm like for everybody's right to make an argument and make a case it's the stealth part that I can't abide um, and, and the dishonesty uh, um, and, and cynicism with which this cause is advancing but I mean he was a very smart man his, his work did get redundant over time I would definitely say that but I mean he did win a Nobel Prize in economic sciences, although if you also know the history of the economics Nobel Prize, it's different from the other prizes, and it was actually set up by the Swedish bank, so it's not the same kind of recognition <laughs> that, say, the, you know, the prize in literature is, or the Peace Prize, or other things. But thank you for that. Yes. So I, I'm um, a physician, but I train young people in health and medicine uh -huh. uh, who, are, who are trainees to use social media for health advocacy and public, public education. Uh -huh. It's one of the things I do. And when I was sitting there, um, you know, with the fear of God being struck in me by this conversation, which is like, I mean, not that yeah. I, d I was completely unaware of it, but mm -hmm. the extent of the concerted, widespread, um, highly successful, uh, almost there, probably will get there in six states, kind of uh, state mm -hmm. of affairs, I thought to myself, okay, I've seen people on social media, which should be the great enlightener and prevent secrecy uh -huh. from happening. I've seen people say things like, don't pay attention to the distractor in chief, pay attention to what's really happening and what his mm -hmm. antics are supposed to hide. I've seen people make these cryptic comments, but I don't know if that's so helpful. I think it would be much better if there was a way to train the now, mm -hmm. as you say, one of the voting uh, groups that's disenfranchised is millennials, right? Mm -hmm. So these young people are one of, it would be really wonderful to train them to shed light. Mm. And so I wondered if you know of anyone doing this, mm -hmm. like as far as successful counter movements, uh -huh. because then I could point the people I train towards that kind of advocacy uh -huh. too, because frankly it is health advocacy because one of the yeah. things that's being taken away is any kind of health safety net. Yes. And so um, that was my question. Do you know yeah. of anyone doing this in social media that I could look to that we could we could use their their ability to educate quickly uh -huh. about this process. Uh, fabulous question, and your work sounds really interesting and important. Uh, and public health is in the crosshairs of this operation. I've actually, I was so excited when I got a note from a national group of public health folks inviting me to speak in the fall. I was like, thank you for finding this book, because these, these guys, I mean, the reason we don't have fighting for um, uh, uh, the Zika, I mean, funding for the Zika virus is thanks to them. There's constant attacks. On, on public funding from, from this crew, you know, obviously, you know, trying to stop uh, um, the Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid expansion. So really big threat to public health uh, from this cause. And I think what you're talking about with grassroots health educators is just a great model for the kind of citizenship education that we need. So I would love to see that. I don't think that anybody is yet doing that, but I think there are groups that have the capacity for that and the interest. So there's groups like DEMOS, like the Center for Popular Democracy, Scholars 
Strategy Network, the Roosevelt Institute, there's all kinds of groups out there who are doing pro-democracy work, who could think about doing what you're doing. And also, I'm sure we've all been inspired by the Parkland students and the March for Our Lives, right? And that... That is an amazing example, too, of young people, you know, telling, and they make fun of us, you know, I don't know if you heard, but the, the one young man said, like, you know, it's like adults, like, we can't use our phones and send tech messages, and we seem not to be able to use our democracy, so they have to show us how it's done. Um, so, uh, so I think that there's, there's that. Um, so there's a lot, I actually do think there's a lot to hope for in this moment. I think something is stirring in this country where people are getting this, the stuff that's built up over years. Um, we're responding to the teachers. You know, the teachers from um, uh, West Virginia to Oklahoma, Kentucky, Arizona now, lots of people are reacting against the impact of what this donor network has been doing to our politics and public policy. But I think that's a brilliant idea to have young, young folks out there, and especially for things like the midterms, because there's two electorates. There's the presidential electorate and there's the midterm electorate. And we keep smashing back and forth between them. And if we could only get young people to see the importance of mobilizing at midterms as well, in presidential years and to pay attention to state politics uh, and, and pay attention to politics in the campuses where they attend school, I think we'd, we'd get a long way. So thank you. So I think we have, do we have three here? So we'll make this our last three questions. Okay. Well, actually, and just a recommendation, quick question, and hopefully we'll do a, a quick response to this way. Okay. We'll have time because I want to make sure you can sign a lot of books. Okay. I actually have two questions, one for the audience, and it's a yes or no. Well, by show of hands, how many people here are under 50? Show of hands. Okay, less than 5% of the people here are under 50. So my question to you is, what's the silver bullet to get to the other 95%? Uh -huh. I'm, a, I'm a PCO, I'm a Democratic, Democratic Party precinct committee officer out in a rural area in uh -huh. eastern King County. And I walk around my precinct, uh, about 80% of them are Republican. How do I get to them? How do I get, how do I get to my kids who are 30 uh -huh. and 31, one's married, has, I have a grandchild, uh -huh. you know? So it's the other half of your question. You know, it's, it's how do you, how do you, what's the tool, you're touring all over the country and you're mm -hmm. hearing sympathetic audiences, how about the people that aren't so sympathetic? Mm -hmm. What are you saying to them that maybe gets them to listen and to speak and to engage? So that's my question. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Well, first of all, I want to say, I love older people, and older people are, be, you know, we're here at a senior center, and I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm being playful, but also older people are responding to this, I think, for really important reasons to take note of, which is that older people, many of them remember how things were. I have met so many older Virginians, black Virginians, who remembered what the state was like, or white liberal Virginians, or others, you know, sort of pre-environment. I mean, remember the Cleveland River started on fire? Anyway, so there's people who remember what things were like, how hard it was to get some of these things in place, how much is at risk now, and also they don't want to leave this cruddy world to their kids and grandkids. So I think that's a wonderful thing. Older people know a ton of people usually. They have networks. They have resources. If they're retired, they have some free time. So I'm all for getting lots of older people involved, and I think the indivisible groups have been a great example of that, of older people and younger people uh, working together. So I think I think we need both, um, but... but um, uh, so I don't, I guess that's not a but, it's an and. Um, but uh, the second thing that you raised about reaching others, I, I don't have a magic solution for that, and I do also t teach the history of social movements. So I tend to think your time, if you don't have a limited amount of time to contribute, your time is probably better spent getting, reaching the people who are easier to reach, who already share your values and care about these things and could be moved into action. But that said, I think there are also ways in which we could reach those other folks. This libertarian ethical system, and there is a starkly coherent ethical system that is part of this, is at odds with the best of every major religious tradition in the world. So I've talked about that at every opportunity I can. I've started to speak to religious audiences about that. I think that's one way to reach such folks. Also Republicans, I mean, you know, my dad voted Republican. He died in 2000. I don't think he'd recognize this party now, but you know, there's people who are scratching their heads going, what happened to my party? You know, not that it was, you know, problem pre, pre before, but I mean, it's really become something else now. So I think there's those folks. The last thing I'll say, the VA. I don't know if people are paying attention to this, but the Trump administration is rushing to privatize the Veterans Administration using the co-created Concerned Veterans of America, a kind of fake group that they've convened with Coke monies, and they are pushing this through the VA against all the other veterans groups, including the American Legion, 
the VFW, AMVETS, and beyond. This is an issue that people need to pay attention to, and I think that's a place where you could really break some people off so, um, and help them understand that these guys are not their friends. So I guess that's, that's what I'd say. Thanks. And also, any questions we don't, we can also talk one-on-one -on -one when we do the, the signings. Uh, thank you for being uh -huh. here. Thank you for writing the book. And I have an answer to one of your questions, which is uh -huh. what should we call this? But let me, let uh -huh. me ask my question first, which is you talked about the, the origins of this being in the anti, uh, or the resistance to segrega and, uh, desegregation. Mm -hmm. So the question I have is how much is this is really rooted in trying to spread what used to be the, the structure and politics of the South mm -hmm. na nationwide to, the, to create a, are they really a redeemer, a, re a resurrected redeemer uh -huh. movement? And that's what they sound like. And so I'm asking, that's, well, th I'll leave it at that question. Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, and I think, well, th these, these guys reacted to Brown versus Board of Education in the way that they did because it came after the New Deal which was challenging their whole system of racial capitalism, right? So the, the race and the class have been entwined from the beginning with this cause. And it's a shame that so many liberal you know, commentators seem not to get this and keep wanting to do this silly identity politics versus class politics thing because they're all together and the right is very strategically using racism. So if we don't challenge it, we play into their hands. Uh, but you're absolutely right that the vision of liberty that this cause um, upholds looks a lot to me like the, the Virginia of the 1950s and the traditions of the South that went into the attacks on Reconstruction, right? And attacking the legitimacy of African-American citizens because the freed people made claims on government. So, um, so there's a deep history here that's being nationalized. And that's another reason why we're seeing so much of this pro-Confederacy. You know, if you look at a lot of these pro-Confederate things, lo and behold, you see a lot of libertarians there. Um, and um, the group on Coke My Campus uh, just last week re released a big, report showing how much the Charles Koch Foundation is funding these neo-confederate thinkers um, and, and uh, white supremacist you know, uh, thinkers who, who use the confederacy as a model. So, great point. So, thank you. And the, the, the question, the, the, no, I just want to give her the answer to her question, which oh. is state corporatism uh -huh. or fascism? That's the answer. I don't, I, I actually, I'm not with you there, but we can, well, we can I, I agree on one and differ on the other. That's fine, thank you. Thank you for talking tonight. It occurs to me that we're very lucky that President Obama didn't sign a memo somewhere that said the sun comes up in the morning or we'd be <laughs> living in the dark. Nicely and and put. my question to you, your, your book is about intellectual people and intellectual arguments. Uh -huh. Where does the viciousness come from that, that, that cut everything down, fight mm -hmm. everything to the death? The emotional viciousness is what really runs these people, not mm -hmm. their highfalutin arguments. You know, when they get drunk, they're not talking about the highfalutin arguments. Mm -hmm. They're talking about all the grievances, the emotional mm -hmm. grievances. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm not sure if you've read the book, but the book really does go into these two characters, James Buchanan and Charles Koch. And so I think you'll find a lot more of that human stuff that you're talking about uh, in the book rather than what I've uh, said here. And by looking at Buchanan's private papers and uh, correspondence and what have you um, against the published record, I think I've been able to provide much of what you're talking about, but you'd be the judge if you read it and you don't find it, then you read can the book. criticize me. <laughs> Thanks so much for this thought-provoking discussion. When are you running for office? You'll be terrific. <laughs> well, I think that's it for questions. Did you have any closing comments you wanted to make? No, and I just, I really do enjoy the one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, with the signings too. So if you have questions and we weren't able to take them up, feel free to ask them um, when we do the signings. Thank you, well, so thank, you so thank you so much for your questions. Nice to be in Seattle. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Great.